I'm, I'm going to give um, a brief overview um, of the center, and that will lead to an, uh, into a series of presentations by my colleague, who will focus uh, more sharply on the four research themes and the working group that are at the core of the center's work. Uh, but I just want to set the context. Um, we're, um, we're a mix of social and natural scientists at the center with a growing number of PhD students. Um, and we have some real challenges if we think objectively about the field that we're working in, water security, food security, resilience. Um, and these are not easy challenges, but I think it is important to uh, briefly mention the context that we are in a world where there's hunger and undernutrition affecting about a billion people worldwide, but malnutrition has a second phase to it, the fact that there are people eating too much of the wrong types of foods. So we have a staggering 2.1 billion people who are obese or overweight. In terms of drinking water, 18% of the world's population still does not ha have access to clean drinking water. And at the same time out there, there's an increasing frequency of natural and human-made disasters. There's unpredictable change and instability affecting the availability, the access, the quality, and the stability of water um, and food supplies. Now, CORE was born in that context. That's not to say that we're going to solve all the problems. Um, we, more modestly, we hope to make a contribution to addressing uh, these issues and finding solutions, technological, institutional, policy solutions um, that are not often thought of out there in the world of academia and policy think tanks. But again, let me remind you of the world context. This, this particular graph was produced by uh, a sister center, the Stockholm Resilience Institute. <coughs> And they looked at the uh, status of seven planetary boundaries, things like ocean acidification, fresh water use, um, ozone depletion. And what's striking is that the ones indicated in red, the loss of genetic diversity, uh, the loading of the environment with nitrogen and phosphorus, are directly linked to agriculture and particularly intensive forms of agriculture of this kind. These are highly industrial farming systems that heavily rely on fossil fuel inputs in the form of nitrogen fertilizers, pesticides, uh, machinery, and fuel to run all, all of the system. Now, in our center, we're trying to look at alternative paradigms to this linear throughput model, which is fairly dominant, but not totally. There, there, there is diversity out there in food and water systems. Um, and what we're trying to do is, is look at systems that are far less uniform, centralized, based on coercion um, and uniformity, to systems that are based much more on diversity, decentralization, dynamic adaptation, and democracy. These are the big paradigm questions. It's not off the, off the radar screen to, to raise these questions. There have been a number of international statements done by the UN, the World Bank, and other international bodies saying that business as usual in food and farming is no longer an option. We really do need to find alternatives. So modestly, in core, we're trying to make that contribution in partnership with people and partners around the world. And our key approaches are around agroecology, farming in the image of nature, trying to redesign farming systems and food systems in such ways that they borrow much more on the structure and function of natural systems. So we're into eco-literacy, into ecological design, but also traditions like holistic design and permaculture, uh, local food webs and alternative food networks that bring producers and consumers together, reducing the distance between them and have a territorial-based sustainable development approach 
We're also looking at models of circular economy that bring together food production with energy production and water and waste management in circular systems, both in rural and urban areas. And this is very, very important, relocalizing production and consumption in a number of places along the rural urban spectrum. And of course, we also focus on policy change to move the system in ways that are more sustainable, virtuous, and equitable. And one of the ways we do this is to bring back biodiversity into the food system from seed to plate. Uh, this is very, very important, moving away from uniform, genetically uniform monocultures or intensive livestock systems that have no diversity uh, to systems that by virtue of their design, their diversity are able to sponsor their own soil fertility, their pest management, yield multiple uh, products, and at the same time provide diverse livelihoods and market opportunities for farmers. You will hear the word resilience a great deal today. Um, very simply, uh, this idea of resilience is the capacity of a system to adapt to sudden change, to stresses, to weather stresses and, and, and shocks, um, to absorb disturbances. Um, and let's say that the more resilient models that we might have in human societies as well as natural systems tend to be based on variability and diversity. They've got a lot of self-regulating features. There's indirect management. Um, there are risks that are minimized. And we're talking about systems that are in relative dynamic equilibrium at different points in time and space. Um, and they contrast with the, the risk management model, which is much more vulnerable to shocks and stresses. And that diagram up there gives you an idea that if you tilt the risk management model a little bit, the, the ball falls off. Um, and uh, it has very little capacity to absorb disturbances and uh, so, in practice, it means that the kind of food and farming systems that we're looking at with our partners are much more diverse. Um, you know, whether in Spain or in Morocco, Indonesia, or, or Mexico, we're essentially dealing with systems that have high levels of functional biodiversity and offer many, many enterprises to, to farmers. And these are the sort of systems that have the, the buffering capacity um, these are the sort of systems that reduce carbon footprints and ecological footprints that are so problematic at this point in time. This week, um, John mentioned the Paris Conference on, on Climate Change. The Conference of Parties was hearing that food and agriculture will contribute something like 30 to 50 percent of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. We have a problem. We need to rethink the way we produce, distribute, and consume food. Um, but it also applies to water. Drinking water is a food. It's very, very important. The other thing you'll hear about today is this idea of transdisciplinarity and people's knowledge. All the environments I just showed are actually a co-production between human beings and natural processes. They're co-constructed um, from, from genes to whole landscapes. And in that context, people, um, fisher folk, water users, uh, farmers, their producers, their creators, their engineers, uh, their builders, their architects, their, their architects and artisans. They have knowledge which is very, very important. And the trick in our center is to try and develop research that combines these vernacular forms of knowledge, indigenous knowledge, local knowledge, citizen knowledge, with the knowledge of scientists working in the social and natural science. And this is very, very important to try and come up with solutions to the pressing social, environmental, and economic problems that surround food and water today. So transdisciplinarity for us is a form of research that integrates different ac academic disciplines from the humanities, the arts, the social science, the natural sciences, as well as diverse forms of knowledge. And we're comfortable working with people's experiential knowledge, their cultural knowledge, and spiritual knowledge. This is important in the work we do with partners around the world. The research outcomes tend to be co-produced and mobilized together with participants. There's a recursiveness and iterative nature to the way we produce and co-validate knowledge. And we have 
generally network-based approaches to knowledge production and its co-validation. And these networks tend to be horizontal. They're inclusive, they're participatory. They make best use of distributed expertise and the capacity of people and scarce resources. And finally, these are the sorts of contexts of knowledge production and its validation that allow for a lot of cross-fertilization of ideas and co-ownership over research processes and results. It enables us to move beyond the boundaries and silos of disciplines and start developing forms of collective intelligence that draw on different knowledge systems. The science that we learn at university, but also vernacular knowledge, the knowledge of mechanics, workers, farmers, water users. And this is very, very important. Um, this is perhaps the best approach we have to come up with meaningful solution to people and places around the world. Now, this is a center that works both on food and water. Initially, we talked about the food side and the water side, and increasingly we're bringing together food and water as an integrated whole. And that was a challenge initially, but I think now we're moving to a position where we're integrating food and water. And we look at the multiple linkages between food and water that actually influence resilience and human well-being. Um, without forgetting that all human activities are rooted, are rooted in natural systems. So we take into account the whole water cycle and the ecosystem processes that renew the water cycle and drive it, and then link it up to food production, water management, and economic um, outcomes. We're particularly interested in knowing how uh, the availability of food and water are affected, the quality of food and water, questions of access to food and water, and the stability of supplies of food and water. These, these are common themes that we increasingly address, whether we're doing more work on water-based systems or agricultural systems, land-based systems. And to do that, we've organized ourselves into four major research themes. The first one deals with resilient food and water systems in practice. The next one focuses on community self-organization for resilience. The third on fundamental resilience, the science uh, of fundamental resilience, uh, understand, understanding the underlying processes and dynamics. And the final one focuses on policies and institutions for resilient food and water systems. We've also felt the need quite recently to introduce a new working group which we call People's Knowledge and Transdisciplinarity. And this is a cross-cutting working group which we set up over the last month. And this is the way we work in CORE. Um, there are new needs that appear and we're happy to rethink the way we do our business and bring in what's needed at a particular point in time. Now, in the rest of this afternoon's presentations, you're going to hear short talks on each one of these themes. Uh, my colleagues will take it in turn to briefly give you an overview of what's happening in these different themes. And then, after these presentations, we'll have time for one-to-one -one discussions, focus groups, interactions, where you will have an opportunity to question us, to query us, to challenge us, um, to argue with us. That's what we want. This is, this is a, a place of ideas, and we need, we need to be challenged. We don't have everything right. And it's wonderful that so many of you are here, particularly younger people. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure for me to see so many people from different faculties of the university. And it's really an opportunity to engage, to talk, to discuss in an informal setting. And we will have that informal setting with champagne and can canapé, I think, yeah, champagne and canapé, afterwards. And we'll close roughly around 4.15, 4.30. I think we have to be out of here at 4.30, 16.30 today. So with that, I'll thank you again for coming along. It really is a joy to see you here. And we're available to discuss, to share more. Obviously, we can only give you a small bite, a small impression of what's happening in a, short, in a, in a brief presentation. But we can go deeper afterwards in the interactive sessions. So with that, I'm going to invite Professor Moya Knivsi, who will be talking about community self-organization for resilience. Moya, it's all yours. Thank you.